uh, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Drew Oakley, and I'm so glad that you're here and have this time and, uh, to share with us today. We are finishing up Walk This Way, my never-ending series. Uh, this is part eight of Walk This Way. So it feels like if you're new to us and it feels like you're coming in at the end of the movie, have no fear. Go to tcat.church slash walk this way. Um, we've got all the messages from the, the previous seven parts, along with some discussion questions and some way that you can kind of apply some of this and see where we've been going for the past few weeks. Um, and I want to give you some recap uh, as we kind of close out this series. To begin um, kind of our, our time together today, I want to walk back and see all the ground we've covered together. So um, here's a few things that we've talked about first. The very first thing we talked about was that everybody's invited to follow. When it comes to following Jesus, this invitation is blanket. It is everybody. There's nothing you've done. Uh, there's nothing you haven't done. There's, there's nothing you, you should do or shouldn't do that would, that would restrict you from being invited to follow Jesus. He, he invited everyone. And in fact, it's an invitation to a relationship. It's not just an invitation to church. It's not just an invitation to join a small group. It's not just an invitation to read the Bible. It's an invitation to a relationship with Jesus. That's what he wants. He invited us to, to come with him, to walk this way with him. The next thing we talked about was that being a sinner is a prerequisite to following Jesus. In fact, you know, a lot of us think that I gotta, we got to clean ourselves up before we can follow Jesus. But everybody, every person in the first century that Jesus invited to follow him was a sinner. They were someone who was, they were broken. They had things going on in their lives. So it's not a, it's not a, a detriment. It's actually a prerequisite. And, and on top of that, one of the big ones we talked about was that having doubts is a prerequisite to following Jesus. There's something about our faith that, that comes and intersects with doubt as well. Um, and having doubts is a part of following Jesus. One of the things you're not sure about, that's a natural part of what it looks like to walk this way with Jesus. The next one is we talk about the goal. And the goal is overwhelming faith, like faith that overwhelms fear. If you were a part of that message, you remember we talked about this idea that what Jesus is calling us to is not just heaven. Uh, it's not just a get out of hell free card. It's, it's not even just like becoming a part of the church community. It's, a, it's the, the goal at the end of this way, the thing that's at the end of the journey for us is a faith that overwhelms fear, that, that we could be living one day in a place where no matter what came our way, we, we wouldn't be afraid. No matter what we face, we would say Jesus is beside us, he's walking with us, we're walking with him, and our faith would overcome that fear. And that was what the goal is, that's where we're trying to head to together. And then we talked about followers all dressing alike, and we're doing our chick flick PG, and I don't have time to walk back through all that with you, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and watch that message. It was great. I can't cover all of that today. Um, we also talked about the fact that following will eventually cost you something, right? That, that following Jesus is eventually going to cost you something. There are so many benefits to following Jesus, and so many great things are going to happen as you follow him, but sooner or later, it is going to cost you something. And then last week, we talked about the fact that followers are actually great leaders, that that as we follow Jesus and we follow the way in which he told us to live our lives, it creates in us opportunities to be great leaders. And great leaders, people who want to be great leaders, should think about following Jesus because he, he, he did amazing things in his, um, in his entire walk and the things that he was able to accomplish just because he was a great leader. And so he's someone we can model ourselves after. So there you go. That's everything we covered over the past seven weeks. And we got one more to go today. So here's what we're going to do. And eventually, in just a few minutes, we're going to be in John chapter 6. I'll tell you one more story from the life of Jesus um, that I think helps us understand what it looks like uh, to, to, to really ground this idea of following Jesus. But to do that, I want to set the scene for you a little bit. Um, so if you brought your Bibles with you, your Bible apps, go ahead and turn to John chapter 6. We'll be there in just a second. Let me tell you what's going on. So in the story I'm about to tell you, just before this, Jesus had fed the 5,000. If you grew up in church or Sunday school, you've heard that story before. Jesus was sitting on the, the, the mountain, uh, kind of looking out over the lake um, in Galilee, and 5,000 people gathered around. Just, that's just the men. It was probably way more than that. And he fed them. Uh, he he you know, took the loaves and the bread, the bread and the fishes and all the things, and he was able to multiply that and feed this entire crowd of people. So right after that, those people like go bonkers. They want to make Jesus king. And Jesus doesn't want to be declared king. He's not interested in that at this point, okay? So um, they're, they're like pressing in on him and they're like trying to shout like, let's make him king, let's make him the ruler. And so he kind of, he jettisons himself from the place, gets in a boat, goes across the lake and stops. 
He goes to this place called Capernaum. Um, and then the next day, uh, those, some of those people figured out that Jesus, like, he had, he had kind of fled the scene, and they found him in the synagogue at Capernaum. And uh, so they're gathering with Jesus, and he's starting to teach again, and then they're kind of, like, taunting him a little bit at this point. So, like, hey, Jesus, do the thing again. <laughs> you know, hey, Jesus, do the thing. You know, like, hey, give us a sign. Show us that you're the Messiah. Like, I brought somebody else with me, and he would like some bread, too. Uh, and in fact, they kind of, like, they tease it out of him a little bit by telling stories. It's like, hey, you remember our ancestors? Hey, I know a cool sign. They ate the bread in the wilderness. What, what, if, you, what if you gave us some bread to prove that you are who you say you are? And so then this, this um, um, Jesus finds himself in this tension. He's teaching in the synagogue where there's kind of like these hecklers and they were people who clearly followed him from the 5,000 because let's, let's just be honest for a minute. If, if, if you were in a crowd uh, and you watched Jesus perform a miracle in which he fed everybody, like everybody that was there got something to eat, you're gonna go, wow, do that again, right? Especially if you're someone who doesn't have a whole lot to eat all the time. It's like, is Jesus now my vending machine? Can I get the things that I want from him all the time? So they're following him, like, hey, do the thing. Do the thing, Jesus. So Jesus, undeterred from his mission, begins to kind of take the metaphor of that and explain to them, like, look, and I know you, I fed you with bread and fish yesterday, but listen, I am the bread. Like, you know how your ancestors ate the bread in the wilderness? Um, God's doing something new, and I'm the bread that came from heaven. Well, then this crowd of people go, no, wait a minute. You, you didn't come from heaven. Aren't you that carpenter's son? Aren't you Mary and Joseph's kid? And they, they get in this, like, there's this tension. This hush kind of falls over the crowd where they're like, you didn't come from heaven. We saw where you were born. We know your parents. You grew up around here. This is clearly like, oh, well, you're a really confusing guy. Help us understand what you want. And, and this, this, like, this tension starts to brew in the midst of the synagogue. And so then Jesus starts this sermon. And after all of this, in the midst of this tension, everybody kind of like hushes down, and Jesus begins to teach. Um, and listen to what he says, okay? This is what he begins with. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And at this point, the parents begin to like usher the children out the door because they're like, what are we talking about, Jesus? This is, this is crazy. We, we, we cannibal now? No, no, no. We just want you to make the bread. We just want you to bring the fishes, okay? Do the thing again, Jesus. This, this is kind of hard to listen to. I don't understand what it is that you're, you're, you're trying to teach us in this moment. And so Jesus, again, he continues, whoever eats my, blood, my, my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. And he goes on. And this gets like really, like he goes way out there, okay? Uh, and he continues on this, this line of thought for like five or six more verses, um, explaining to them what he means by this metaphor and this tension grows in the room. They're like, Jesus, what are you talking about? We just wanted you to do a sign. Can you not do the healing thing you did before? Can you not bring the bread like you did before? Can you not just like impress us? Do the thing, do the thing, Jesus. And instead, he won't be deterred. He starts this, this kind of strange teaching, and it gets worse and deeper and crazier, and th there starts to be this murmuring in the crowd. The people that are kind of listening are like, what? What is going on? This is super uncomfortable. And the disciples are looking around, and they're watching this get really uncomfortable, too. And then eventually, finally, John tells us that the crowd, um, here's what happens next. It says that on hearing it, Many of his disciples, and this doesn't mean the 12, this means, we've been following along with this, it means the big crowd, the, the, the group of people who've been following. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this, right? So there's like this murmuring and this uncomfortability that's just set in on the crowd. And yesterday, right? Yesterday, they wanted to make him king. Yesterday, they were like, this is the guy we've been waiting for. He's a rock star. We want to take him up to, the, you know, to Jerusalem right now and set him down in the temple and say, this is the guy. And they were ready to do that. But now they're, they're not really sure. And this massive swing of emotion has happened. This massive tension has built in the midst of the followers that Jesus has gathered around him. Now, here's the thing. Um, Jesus is aware of all this. <laughs> this the coolest thing that happens is uh, so many times in the New Testament, it says that the people are kind of murmuring about something or they're saying something and Jesus knows what's going on before they say it out loud or before anybody else can hear. And so the scripture, John tells us that aware, aware that, there it is, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Like, does this, does this bother you? Is what I'm saying kind of making you uncomfortable? I, I didn't mean, you know, Tell me what you're feeling right now. I'm, I'm kind of confused. Does this, does this like make you uncomfortable too? Because the crowd, you know, I mean, they, they seem uncomfortable, but, but like you guys who are supposed to be my followers, does this, does this offend you? Does this bother you what I'm, 
what I'm saying. And it bothered them so much, John gives us this message. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and, and they unfollowed him. They unfollowed Jesus. Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. This is kind of a pivotal moment um, in, in the last kind of the, 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 uh, the third act, okay, the, the grand climax of what's happening in the passion story. This is a big pivotal moment because now the people went from let's make him king to, you know what, I don't know that I can follow this anymore. Like this, oh, are we talking cannibalism, Jesus? Or, you know, what, what is it you're trying to say? And they just didn't get the metaphor. They just didn't get the message. And it was really, really hard teaching. And here's the thing. The disciples, the 12, okay, the apostles, they're watching all this happen. And they've been with Jesus from the beginning. So they're watching all this stuff unfold. And what they realize is they're losing the crowd. And they were a part of what had happened the day before where they want to make Jesus king. And they had to have been thinking, like, if they make Jesus king, we're kind of the court. Uh, and, and we're, you know, two of them just a few days before had said, Jesus, let us sit at your right hand and your left hand, right? We talked about that last week. And so they're watching all of this kind of unfold, and, and they're nervous. They're getting really uncomfortable that they're losing the crown. And I can imagine that what they wanted to go do is pull Jesus aside and say, dude, get it together, like you're losing the crowd, go out and tell them a parable again, right? Go, go tell them that prayer thing or that blessed is the peacemaker stuff you were talking about. Go, go, go do that. This is not good. Like you're losing the crowd. Jesus, get it together. Now that's not what they did. Um, and and that's, that's not what was recorded, but that's probably what we would want to do too if we were sitting there because the crowd was their protection. The, the crowd meant they had power and authority. The crowd made them feel good, all that stuff. And now Jesus is talking about some really uncomfortable stuff. And all of a sudden, he started to kind of bring that tension back out again that, you know, following Jesus is going to cost me something, Right? Um, and all the way up until now, I've been consuming, and the bread thing was super cool, Jesus, and watching the, he the healing's super cool, but now all of a sudden, like, there's this, people aren't, you know, pe not everybody's on board, <laughs> and people are starting to turn away, and like, you remember that guy we had, he's been with us from the beginning, he's been with us from the beginning, and he just decided to unfollow you, he's not walking with you anymore, Jesus, get it together. Now, Jesus sensing all of this, um, you know, the disciples don't say anything because he's Jesus, and, you know, even though they're thinking it, he probably already knows that. And so he's aware of what's going on in their hearts. And he goes, hey guys, you don't wanna, you don't wanna, you don't wanna leave too, do you? Do you, you don't wanna go with him, do you? You like, you know, you don't wanna leave too, do you? And the truth was, just reading the context and reading the scripture, yeah, some of them did. You know, I could imagine that in back of Peter his mind he's kind of like you know if I just took three or four steps back and like you know kind of melted behind this column and uh and then just kind of slipped out this door and stood in this shadow like I, I could just fade back and so Jesus is looking at these 12 guys the ones that he that he had been with at the beginning the ones who 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 had he had poured his life into the ones that had followed him he'd called them out of their lives the ones that had given up their jobs and given up their families and giving up all their stuff to follow him from the very beginning. And he goes, hey, you, you, you don't want to, you don't want to leave too, do you? And some of us have experienced these moments, right? Some of us have experienced these moments where all of the sudden, all of the sudden, following Jesus starts to cost us something or it makes us really uncomfortable. And usually, not, not all the time, but usually those come in a couple different spots. Some, a lot of times they happen at transitions. And in fact, what's about to happen is Peter's gonna give us a question that he's about to ask that is the most relevant and most important question that can ever be asked, I think, within the context of following Jesus. And the younger you are, just so you know, the younger you are, the more important this question is. The younger you are, uh, the more relevant this question is gonna become or should become to your journey in the next few years. This is a really, really important question. But, but in the back of their minds, they're going, you know, is this really worth it? You know, do, do, I, do I really wanna keep this up? And we as people today, we, we face these challenges all the time. And they usually come in a couple different spots. They happen at transitions. So like, you know, from the time of moving from middle school to high school, uh, students moving from middle school to high school, for students moving from high school to college, for uh, college graduates moving from college into the first job, um, a lot of those transitions, those are tension points for us that create these spaces where we start to ask the question, is, you know, 
do we really want to go to? Do we want to hit the unfollow button on Jesus? I mean, think about this for a minute. Some of you all who, you know, growing up in the South, right? You grow up in the South, and everybody goes to church, and everybody talks about Jesus all the time, and then you go to college, so you go from Alabama to Cincinnati or, or you know, somewhere, uh, you know, someplace where the Jesus following is not that big a deal, right? Um, and, and it becomes this place, like, is it still relevant to me? Everybody went to Jesus, you know, followed Jesus before, but now I'm in a different place, and it's just different, and it feels harder, and it feels like there's like a, an act on me that I wasn't having before. It's not just a natural motion anymore. And so those transition points, like middle school to high school, high school to college, college to first job, all of those transition points become places where we, we, we've been tempted to, to say, you know, is this the time to hit the unfollow button on Jesus? The younger you are, the more of those transitions you have ahead of you. And places, then places where you have to decide, what am I going to do in those moments? The other place it happens a lot is relationally, all right? Because uh, you, you go to a place where you're like, oh my gosh, he is so cute, but he's not a Christian, right? And my Christianity is kind of getting in the way of this relationship. And you have this tension of like, should I, should I keep following Jesus? Is this relationship supposed to be the thing? And it creates this tension and this question in your mind. Or, or you know, like, oh my gosh, she is just so... And there's a, she is just so, there's a lot of so, right? Uh, and you start thinking in your mind, like, you know, everybody can become a Christian, but not everybody can be so, right? Um, and, you know, you just start this wrestling thing, like, you know, I, it, I can come back to this later, or, or, you know, I don't know, this is getting in the way of this relationship, and she's not where I am in my faith, and maybe this isn't irrelevant anymore. It's not as relevant as it was. And this tension comes, this 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 difficulty kind of like gets in your way this obstacle seems to stand before you and it's relational or it's transition based or whatever and you find yourself asking like is this my time to kind of fade away from this is this my time to kind of step back from this is my is this my time to hit the unfollow button on Jesus now believe it or not I've had two different occurrences like this in my life um, one where I made what I think was the wrong choice and one where I made one that I think was the right choice and the first one I talk about quite a bit um, was when, when I left high school and went to college and one of those transition moments for us, my faith became completely irrelevant. And, and I had not built it the right way. I had not, you know, uh, tried really hard to be connected to people, but I was in a tension. I was in this moment where, where um, I, I went off, you know, I went from a small rural town where everybody went to church and everybody knew everybody to this giant city to go to college and nobody knew where I was getting up on Sunday morning to go to church. And nobody cared. Um, and it just became this really irrelevant thing for me and I found myself stepping away from my faith. Now, um, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that some of the biggest regrets that I have in my life happened in the section of time that happened just after that unfollowing Jesus and the time that I decided to come back. And I did have a time where I decided to come back where my life had just kind of completely split in half and things were just not working the way that I wanted them to. And, and um, I realized in deep in my heart, it wasn't a thing where I just stopped believing in God. And most of the time for you, if you face these areas, it won't be a time where you stop believing. It'll really just be, you know, I don't know that this is where I want to be right now, right? And, I, and you're so tempted to hit the unfollow button. But the other one that happened for me and the place where this really became real for me believe it or not, um, was right after I graduated college and had made the decision that I wanted to go to seminary and become a pastor. Um, so I'd graduated with my degree that I'd been working on for four years, and I'd felt this call, this urgency in my life to become a pastor, and I went, and, and I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the job offers behind. I'm going to step away from the career. I'm going to go, you know, go find the seminary. There was a seminary that I'd found that was like you know, all the Greek and all the Hebrew and all the, you know, like it was all the stuff and it was where I wanted to go. I wanted to learn. I wanted to be you know, like just steeped in this stuff. And so I, I you know, I gave up my job offer that I've been given from Atlanta. I moved uh, closer to where the seminary was in central Kentucky, signed up, you know, got all the student loans stuff lined out and, um, and I'm registering for classes. I'm on campus and written my kind of my papers and everything and I'm standing on campus um, and I'm moving from bookstore to, you know, to, to like, like, you know, to the, the admissions office of the bookstore to get my, you know, my ID and all the things on campus. And I just had this overwhelming, like, sense of absolute terror. It's the only way I can describe it. And I'm looking around at all these people that just, like, they already had Bible degrees, and I felt, like, completely out of place. Like, these people don't understand how the real world works. And, you know, like, I don't, I don't know that I belong here. And, like, I just had this overwhelming sense of, is this really what I want to do? Like, you know, this is, you're making this your life. This is a huge decision. Like, I know, you know, I got this calling and this difficulty, but like, oh my gosh. 
Now, am I gonna do this for the rest of my life? Is this really what I'm gonna do? And, and I'm walking around this campus and I'm, I'm thinking about like, this is gonna cost me a fortune and look at these books I gotta read and you know, I don't, I, don't, you know, I don't know that I'm gonna fit in with any of these people and they just seem so different than me and I'm, you know, I don't have a Bible degree. I'm gonna sit down in these classes. They're gonna think I'm an idiot. Like I had all this stuff that's just weight and I just thought, you know what, I could. I could just, I could just hit the uh, undo, undo button on this. I, I haven't showed up for class yet, you know. I haven't, haven't signed the papers and, you know, I can undo the loans and, and I could just go back to that job offer. I'm sure, it's only been a week, right? I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure they'd still give me the job. And I just stood there for a minute thinking about all of this and just feeling this weight. Um, and this story, this, this, this scripture that I'm about to read you, this question that, that Peter asks, um, this powerful question that Peter asks, uh, became something that started resonating in my mind, um, and, it, and it actually led me to the decision that I made. I want to share this with you. This is huge. This is probably the most important question that anybody who's wrestling with whether to follow Jesus or not should possibly ask. Here's what it is. Simon Peter looked at him and answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Yeah, Jesus, you're right. Like looking at this and hearing what you're saying and realizing all this stuff about you're know, going to go to the cross and you know um, this, these teachings difficult and following you is 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 become really hard and it may not lead to the throne and it may not lead to the glory and it may not lead to the honor like like we kind of thought but to whom shall we go like who who else who else are we going to follow in other words Peter's going look we weighed the options. And we've seen what's going on. And you know, it's like Peter's the guy who says the thing that he shouldn't have said. This is that one moment where Peter's absolutely brilliant. He gets a couple of those in the Gospels. And he's absolutely brilliant because he goes, look, you know, in order for us not to follow you, we're gonna have to follow somebody else because that's how it works. If we're not following you, then we're following somebody. So to whom shall we go? And then he like caps it off by going, hey, you have the words of eternal life. You've said stuff. And you've done stuff. And you've showed us that we have seen too much. And we have experienced too much. And yeah, it looks like it's gonna be hard. And yeah, it looks like it'll be difficult. But who, to whom shall we go? And to that, you know, the crowd might come up to Peter or Bartholomew or James or John and go, guys, like, wait, listen. You mean to tell me you're gonna keep following Jesus? Yeah, but you don't know where it's gonna go. No, I don't. But to whom shall I go? Well, yeah, but like, what if it, what if it doesn't turn out the way you thought it was? Yeah, I know. But I've seen too much and I've heard too much. To whom shall I go? You know, but well, wait a minute. Are you saying to me that you don't know where it'll go and you don't know where the destination is, but, but, but you've weighed this out, you're gonna do it anyway? Yeah, yeah. Because to who else is gonna do what Jesus has done? Who else is gonna be the leader that Jesus has been? Who else is gonna take us where Jesus has promised to take us? And I don't know how it's gonna get there, and I don't know what all the stops between look like, but to whom shall we go? And Peter has this like really introspective moment that like peers through centuries to each and every one of us where we're sitting here and maybe you're sitting in this very spot right now going, maybe this is the time like we're post COVID and we don't know about the church and we're not really sure like what this looks like going forward. Maybe this is the time to just kind of step back. And Peter asked the question that I think all of us should be asking, which is to whom shall we go? And then finally, Peter says, we've come to know We've come to believe and we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We, like, we've seen too much. We've done too much. You've done too much. We, we cannot, without a shadow of doubt, believe that you're not who you say you are. So, to whom shall I go? I'd like us all to just say this out loud if you will with me, okay? This is a question we'll have to ask. To whom shall I go? Say it out loud with me. To whom shall I go? That's the question. That's what we all have to wrestle with. If you, if you decide that it's the time in your life to hit the unfollow button on Jesus, you have to know who you're gonna follow. And the, like, I don't need to unca or unpack this again like I did a couple weeks ago, but like, you're not worth following like Jesus is. I'm not worth following like Jesus is. Our names aren't the ones that are worth glorifying. We gotta confront our ego in the midst of that a little bit and realize, like, if not Jesus, who? If not Jesus, what? To whom? Shall I go? Now, remember, this stuff kind of happens in, in various different spots in our life, okay? It's like transitions and temptations and troubles. They all cause questions in our lives. There are questions in our faith. And that's a natural human experience. When you find yourself in a place where change has happened in your life, 
Of course it's going to create questions. And of course it's going to create doubts. And of course it's going to create places where you have to kind of like think things through. Those transition points of moving from, from one stage of life to another create major changes in your life. And then you're faced with temptation too. When you're faced with things that like, you know, but that looks so good or he, like he's so good or she's so awesome or whatever, right? And you're faced with those, those temptations, those moments. Those create questions in your mind. Trouble creates these questions, these, these doubts that you might have in your mind. It always does. It always does for every human being that goes into these areas. But here's the thing. This is the place where you should be asking the question, to whom shall I go? Because you have to decide in those moments. If you're in a place where like change has happened, if you're not going to follow Jesus, you're following something or someone. Who is that? To whom shall I go? Think about the experiences that you've had thus far. Think about the things that God has already done in your life. To whom shall you go? Who has the words of eternal life? Who is the one who has brought you into this new understanding of the way the world works? And here's the other good news. When you consider the options, it actually brings clarity. When you sit back and ask the question, it's actually gonna help clarify the answer. And that's really, if I might say, most of us, not all of us, but most of us, when we make bad decisions, usually it's because we didn't really think through all of the options. We didn't think through all of the responses. We, we didn't think about what was gonna happen. And believe it or not, you have talked yourself into every bad decision you've ever made. And I have to say, having lived through both these types of situations in my life, I, I can say without a shadow of a doubt that, that in the moment in which I hit the unfollow button on Jesus, um, once I came back and realized what I'd done, I, I wished so bad that I had a time machine that I could go back to that moment where I hit the unfollow button on Jesus and not do it. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt that that moment where I sat in my seminary class and I was looking around at this world going, is this really what I want my life to look like? because I didn't know about you all, <laughs> and I didn't know about this future, but I'm sitting in that moment, and I just think, I, I think now, thank God I didn't hit the unfollow button. And people, most of the people in this room have experienced this before, so if you're in this place right now, ask somebody. And I'm gonna tell you that if they're still sitting here after going through that, they're gonna look at you and say, I am so glad I didn't do that. And you will be so glad you don't. You'll be so glad you don't. But when you're in the middle of this moment, in the middle of this tension, sometimes it gets hard to think. And, and what's beautiful is, Peter didn't try to lie. He didn't try to deny his doubts. He didn't try to deny like what he was feeling or you know, what he'd been through. He didn't try to deny how hard everything looked. He just said, you know what? Yeah, it's complicated. But to whom shall I go? You, know, you, you have the words of eternal life. You, you have, we, we've come to a place where we believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God, that you are who you say you are. And if you really are who you say you are, I don't completely understand what might be happening right now, but I'm with you. And I don't know that like, you know, this is exactly gonna work out every way that I thought it was gonna go, but, but I'm with you. That's that question. Like that's, that's the bottom line. To whom shall I go? To whom shall I go? shall I go? Let me pray for you. But God, I just want to thank you for um, preserving this story, God, um, for, for giving us the ability to sit here thousands of years later and talk about this pivotal moment in the life of Jesus' disciples and the life um, uh, that your son lived on this, in this world. Um, and God, that, that we all face these moments. We all face these transitions. We all face these difficulties where, where we're tempted, God, to go, you know, I, I think I might just step back from this. I think I might just lay this thing down because it became hard or it's, it's not quite working out the way I thought or I'm in a transition point or whatever. And God, when we're in those moments, Remind us, especially for those that are sitting in this room right now that feel that, remind us that you're the one who has the words of eternal life. You're the one that, that knows all the things. You're, you're the one. So to whom shall we go? And don't let us make a move until we know the answer to that question. Don't, don't let us be in a moment of saying, you know what, I wanna lay this down and hit the unfollow button. Don't let us make a move until we know who it is that if we're not following Jesus anymore, who it is that we're actually following. Help us to weigh those options carefully. And God, then remind us all, remind us all um, that we've been given the opportunity to follow you. We've been invited to follow you wherever you go. Help us to walk. God, we love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.